I like the topic. <laughs> Very rarely do you go to a place that they give you something that's aligned with what God already gave you. You know, you, you got to respect the house of where you go, so you have to talk about their topical theme, right? It's disrespectful to go to a place and they have labored over a topic in the scripture and you come and preach something totally different. You know, it's disrespectful, you know. Can't do that. You know, they said to preach about giving God thanks and you come and preach about favor. No! We done told them the theme is Thanksgiving. But it's a wonderful thing and it's a wonderful thing to be amongst the prophets and the mystics, I tell you. Because what can I say to you that you don't already know, right? Uh, for all of those who meditated this morning, the Lord has told you already the things that I would say. And so uh, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, for those who said, no, I did not get it. Well, that's why you're at the beginning of the journey, right? right, right? For the mastermind has already heard what God has said. And so it's just an echo. I'm just going to repeat some things that you already know. Mm, yeah. The question is, how do we perfect our eyes so that we can see God prophetically in advance of the need of the people? Let me say it one more time. Our responsibility in this new age and this dawn of the new coming of Jesus is to receive in advance what God has for the people. The problem is, you get the prophecy while the people are hurting. Lift your hands. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. That we receive the word before there's a problem. Come on, say, Lord, we thank you, God, that we receive your word your revelation while we're in a state of peace so that when trouble comes somebody is ready to handle the problem this is the responsibility divine of the prophetic why do you exist and you don't know more than those who do not carry your anointing Why are you prophetic and you don't have the answer to the problems of this age? Who are you to say you know him and can't save nobody? Who are you to say you have his power and anointing, yet there's no one healed when you show up? No one's delivered. We are not better because of your presence. The responsibility of the prophet is to transform the world by his or her very presence. Lift your hands. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That my prophetic anointing changes the atmosphere. Say it one more time. Lord, thank you. That my prophetic anointing Changes the atmosphere. The question is how? Somebody say how. how? I can't, I don't know why I'm fired up. I don't know. I don't know. I'm screaming. <laughs> Y'all I'm shouting. I'm fired up. How will we do it? How in this age will we become the prophetic leaders? that the future needs. How can you lead from the future if you haven't prepared yourself in the present? When tomorrow comes, you'll be just as useless as the previous misfits of another generation. But we're different, aren't we? Are we different? Yeah. Yeah. There's something special about everyone in this room. Look at somebody and just point to them and say, I love you. I love you. <laughs> we will 
not be empty prophets. Will we? It is not about the external form, but the internal form that we are in. Let us just take two minutes to understand why your brother, I'm sorry, they call me brother minister, so that's how I say. Why, brother minister, has been so hard on us prophetically and mystically to push us into a place where we are fully operating today in this time and age in our anointing. Why is that? Well, you know, the master prophet already said it. This time is coming where we will all be needed in a supernatural way. Jesus is, is come, Jesus is appearing to us. And the times that were promised are upon us. Do you believe that? I can't hear you. You believe that? Let, let us historically, though, understand the context that we operate from. This is the 11th Christian age since the end of of the Jesus ministry on earth. First was apostolic period, which was run and led by the gospel and the ministry taught by Peter. Yeah? Is that, yeah? Everybody with me? The second is anti-Nicene period. This is simply where the church spreads and has all these various councils and various ways in which to keep those connected. The next age, the third, is this first seven ecumenical, where it's about how the church tries to organize itself under these ecumenical councils, uh, Nicene, Chalcedon, all these various things, and try to present an organized way to preach, teach, and talk about Jesus. Then they go into Middle Ages, where because of wars, they lose the knowledge. Things are burned all over, you know. Then you have this period where they come back to Renaissance. They begin to rediscover knowledge again. Then you have this age called Reformation, where everybody is talking about those who were left out and how the gospel becomes exclusive, and they need to make it more inclusive. And then you have periods that are known by their century. 17, 18, 19, 20th, and now the 11th age, which is the 21st century. Between the ages of the 18th and 21st, you have the emergence of a primary doctrine that many in the Pentecostal world have come to know and to see that represents the power of God, but is quite misunderstood by those who don't know its power. This is the introduction of what we call the age or the time of the prosperity gospel. Yeah. Prosperity gospel is the overarching Christian way of telling the gospel of Jesus in our current Pentecostal context. But people think it's about money. No. The prosperity gospel has a strong history. Do you mind if I talk about it a little bit? It's prophetic in the sense that it begins with a focus and a belief that there is power in an individual's mind to unlock the blessing of God. The prosperity message begins in 1882, just around there, Europe, America, we don't know for sure, but there's a move that God is teaching and unlocking the mind, and through the thinking and the thoughts of God, we can approach the kingdom in a new way. Everybody with me? There were two movements that came out of this gospeling. The first is a new thought movement. The new thought movement emerged in the late 1800s also, and it centered 
on a basic teaching that required three things. First, if elevated to the maximum, the human potential could be achieved through the salvation event and experience and in so connecting through God, receive a new knowledge of how to live. Yes. The second, it's centered on the teaching that the power of positive thinking is the access to a reality that is not just material, but it is supernatural. The third is that believers could share in God's creative power by using their positive thinking to confess what God had revealed to them in their minds. Uh, it was no longer about seeking God's will when you pray. Rather, it was about proclaiming by faith what you have seen in your prayer time and believing that God would manifest his promises in your life. The prosperity gospel is not about finances in its root, but it is about accessing the promises of God, prosperity, of the gospel manifesting through how you think and you That second movement begins in the 1940s, right after World War II. And many of you have heard of it, but it's called the faith movement. It's where you have the word of faith churches, the word of God. And people begin to adapt that into their Christian experience and their ecclesiology. This was the movement that was based on not just positive thinking, the first movement, but positive confession. Yeah. Uh, the development uh, of this movement became uh, clear uh, that faith was a spiritual law. Yeah. Uh, this movement said that it is the law of God spiritually, that we are bound to God and his word through a legal contract. That because of our faith and our deliverance, God works if we work. That if I'm obedient, he must give to me elements of his covenant. That I would be in peace. That I would be mentally, physically, economically whole. And that if I kept my mind stayed on him, he would keep me in this peace. The peace is the prosperity that the wholeness of God in my life would be maintained by my willingness to stay connected to him through the storms of my life. This faith movement was about knowing how to make it through storms and not allowing the storms to destroy you. The prosperity of God being the attainment of total peace is seen by Jesus saying to the disciples when they cry, Master, 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 the tempest is raging. He says to them, why do you trouble me? You must learn to sleep in a storm. Here, the peace of God is the first prophetic lesson that the prophet must be the peace in the midst of the people's storm. To be able, when they can't handle the rough waves, to lift your hand and say, excuse me, when may you please be at peace with us. Somebody lift your hand and just test it with me. Just lift your hand and think about the things in your life and say, excuse me, when? Be at peace with us. So just lift your hand and say, excuse me, water. I know you're trying to rain right now, but hold on. I need the rain to stop right now. Some of you are in dry places. And prophetically, you need the power to lift your hand and say, I need 
water here. The prophetic blessing of the prosperity is to know that the total power of God, peace be unto you, that, that it dwells in me and the power to allow peace to reign. Oh, I feel my help in here, y'all. Oh, Jesus. Nah. Can I say that part I like once again? Man, I'm doing bad on time. I'm, I will go faster. But I got to say this part I like one more time. The faith movement was about understanding that obedience is the way to God. That if I serve you, Lord, you will serve me. If I keep myself in your way, then you will keep yourself in my way. If I mind your affairs, you will mind. If I bless your house, come on with me, you will bless. Nah. If I honored your word, somebody said, anything that I would lose on earth, say it like you mean it. Anything that I bound on will be. Every time I confess him to the earth, he will confess me. <laughs> Why did the enemy take the prosperity message and deduce it to money? The worst trick of the age is that those who did not know Jesus but were Christian touched the precious gospel of Jesus to bring us peace and total healing and made it simply about earthly transactions. I am whole and well as a faith confession because I've seated and tithed and done what I needed to do and I've honored God. My anointing is equal to my sacrifice. My anointing is equal to my sacrifice. This is the difference between prophetic anointings. Some prophets hear about it when God is doing it. Some prophets hear about it before God has done it. Some prophets hear about it as a part of the confession of God, and God includes them in his decision-making. There are speeds to the prophetic. Some people get the prophetic word when God has already done it. He simply makes you a messenger. Deliver the mail. Other people can get so deep in the prophetic that they hear it before God has done it, and so they come as a proclaimer. Behold, God is about to do a new thing in you. The world has not seen or heard it or received it yet. But some can get so deep in the prophetic that they are welcome into the presence of God. And God begins to say, I want to do something for my people. What should I do? <laughs> and that sounds like the Lord wants to bless you. And I have spoken to the Father on your behalf. And the Lord says he will do it. It's the intercessory. And Jesus goes to sit at the right hand of the Father to be an intercessor for us. This is the highest level of prophetic gift. To influence the move of God, reminding God of people's obedience. Wait, wait. One point on this, and I'm going to leave it because I like talking about this. So I better escape it. But here's the point of your prophetic anointing power meter. For some, struggle comes and they get worse. Oh, you know that's true. When trouble comes, they say they prophetic until the devil shows up. 
and you'll see how fat. Their real anointing is their speed. Because <laughs> the devil comes just to reveal your anointing level. Some think they are anointed with prophetic message when it's just prophetic speed of feet. And when the devil comes, we see they just run fast. Some say they are anointed with prophetic gospeling when it's really a, a prophetic ability to forget. When trouble came, they forgot who their friends were. <laughs> when financial trouble hit their house, they stopped seeding. Some reveal that they're just what? Politically gifted. Because when trouble comes and you can't do something for them, they don't do nothing for you. They're just gifted in transactions. <laughs> I better leave that alone, though. Because I could keep going. But, somebody say but. Says you better put that phone down there and get ready to get this praise here because it's coming right to you on your phone. You can just pause it, pick it back up. But since you did, I got to send this blessing right there to you. You ready? I'm serious. Pause that thing, put this down, and lift your hands. I'm getting ready to send you a blessing. Everybody want to join in her? But there are some of us that troubles make us better. <laughs> Come on, stand on your feet one time. Let me give a praise vote real quick. For some of us, our anointing has grown because every time the devil showed up, I got stronger. Every time a problem came in my life, I held on to my faith more. And God blessed me because I believed in him. And my faith has made me whole. My faith has allowed me to be forgiven. My faith caused my miracle. My faith is what delivered me. And now the devil doesn't even come because he and she realized that they were how I was growing. Somebody say, thank you, God, for victory over every adversary. Appreciate, you can say it, appreciate the times of struggle. But how would Jacob become Israel if he didn't have a little wrestling match? How would Abraham inherit the whole earth if it wasn't for a nephew who wanted more than he did? A little jealousy. How could Jesus become king of all if it wasn't for other leaders who thought he was replacing their church? Faith is the power tool to grow your anointing in the midst of struggle. Don't pray away your growth. That has not come to kill you, but to make you. Somebody say it. Yeah, 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 you, you preach this with me. It has come to make you. Say it one more time. He has come to make you. Oh, Trump has come to make me. Oh, the world has come to make me. And stronger means it's just a time where my finances will be stronger. My health will be stronger. My mind will be stronger. You worry about it if you want to, but this age is an age of strength because my faith has become great. Because he that is in me is able to complete everything that he has started. All right. That's enough of that. The question now. Eh, I'm almost done. Ah, I'll end up here then. The message for us now is what is the age that we are currently entering into? As we shift in a post-prosperity age, there is the coming of a new season. This season has been dubbed 
the age of Pentecost. The prosperity gospel now has come to its fruition, and we are in an age of Pentecost. The age of Pentecost that we are currently entering into is a stage that has a movement as its first manifestation. Ah, I feel Zion. This movement is called the Open Door Movement. <clears throat> yeah, just, just, just clap for all those who have decided. Just give God a praise on that. <clears throat> the Open Door Movement. All right. Uh, can I help you? Just understand it quickly. Um, if you don't mind, again, in a prophetic uh, announcement, just to lift your hands one more time. And that's why we do it, just so you can receive it. So, God, I thank you for the open door. Say it one more time, Lord. I thank you for the open door. Um, for us to enter into this prophetic age, we need a perfected eye. Oh, Lord. Uh, the perfected eye is the ability to see the gospel in a clear way so that we can unlock the closed door. The anointing on this age is for you to receive the keys to the kingdom such that when you get to lock doors, for yourself or for those that you are sent to, that you have the ability. Somebody say, unlock the door. Uh, unlock the door. Uh, uh, this teaching is centered on your ability to find the keys that Jesus left us in the gospel. The first key, he said, and who do men say that I am? Many fumbled around and one said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, sent to save and to deliver. And he says to him, flesh and blood did not reveal this key to you. But this key was revealed because you spent some time with my father. And upon the faith, that I am the Messiah, I'm going to build a church. <laughs> and the gates of hell will not be stronger than the faith of the people behind the gate. So hell will not be able to prevail against this heavenly faith. This first key is important because it represents for us the start of the search in Jesus' life for what is happening. We see again that Jesus tells us, I'll give you the scriptures and you just follow with me. John 14, yeah, um, usually these pages start flipping, that's how I know, or maybe it's buttons, okay, fine. Are you ready? John 14, 6. Jesus gives us another key. And it says what? Oh, yeah. I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one can unlock the key to the Father unless they come through studying my teaching. You can study a lot of people, but if you don't learn Jesus, you can't unlock the Father. Luke 7, 46. I mean, I don't want to do everything. Somebody screaming out. This is how I get a break, you know. Come on now. He, Luke, come on, Luke 7, 46. Now, 
We know in this key that sometimes those who are not included understand how to prepare me for my future. That while those who travel with me argue about oil, this is a perfume moment. The key to the kingdom is knowing how to bless God with what God needs when God needs it. All right. You ready? Everybody got your Bible thing? You know how this is going to go now. Next key, John 4, 48. Just giving you the keys. If you go on like it, y'all. John 4, 48. Yes, yes. The key is that the miracle is not what's important to your next level. It is do you believe that God can do it because you haven't seen it done before. If you will lead from the future, you will be a part of things that the world hasn't seen before. And if you're requiring your faith and your belief to be predicated on evidence and facts, you're going to miss the key to the next level. You got to go forward because God said it, you believe it, and that settles that thing. John 14, 1. So if you're going to start believing, you might as well get another key. Because it goes on, because for there are, and if it was a lie, I would not have wasted your time, and I wouldn't have told you, but I have gone where in your future to do what? For that where I go, I don't want to be by myself, but I'm going to bring you to your future that I prepared for you because you believed it without seeing it. How can you lead from the future if you don't have a perfect eye to see that God is doing something God has never done before and you don't need no proof or no evidence? God said it and we're just unlocking the door to the future. Let's keep going. John 14, take me to 16, 17. I'm sorry, was that like, I don't know. John 14, 16, sorry, I just got you. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. Yes, yes, this is... The first time prayer came up in the mouth of Jesus, he he says to Peter, and he says to the disciples when they could not perform a miracle, he said, you pray to the Father that he increase your faith. Meaning what? The one thing I'm not going to do is ask God to help you believe that I can do it. Jesus says, the one thing I ain't going to do is pray for you to have confidence. How many people you had to say, Lord, please pray to the Lord that I can increase my confidence? No, we don't do that, baby. You get your own confidence. <laughs> you get your own spiritual faith. Uh, the prophet cannot give you an anointing for faith and belief. Uh, Jesus said, you got to work that out on your own. But when you do, say it one more time, sister. That he may abide with you. No, no, stop from the beginning. And I will pray the Father. And, look, look. Uh, Give them the verse right before that. First precept before. So they can see the setup. If you love me. If you love me. You will keep my commandments. And those who because of their love. When it meets their faith and belief. Their love will cause me to move. And their obedience to my commandments that comes through their love that is anchored on their faith, it will what? Read that thing. And I will pray the Father. I now will pray. And he shall wait. Look here. Jesus wouldn't pray for them because without faith, they couldn't love. And without love, they couldn't be obedient. Faith becomes now an important desire that you got to turn on and say, Lord, I have faith. 
Come on, lift your hand. Lord, I, I have faith. Lord, Lord, I brought faith with me. Lord, 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 if I don't have anything else, I believe you can do it. And, and more importantly, Lord, I love you. you. You don't have to do something for me to love you. I, I love you just for who you are. I love you on your record. I love you for what you did for my mama, for my grandmama, for my great-grandmama. You've been in my house for generations, and, and your love overflows. And, and if it wasn't for them, I still have a record. I believe your word. Your word is your character, and I stand on it. And I love you for it. And because I honor you for who you are and for your character, I obey your word and your commandments. What you have said, I do. I honor not only you as the head of the world, but the head of my house, the head of my soul. I follow your word. If you said it, I believe it. If you said it, I will do it. And you honor me because if I love you, you said that love and obedience would make you go to your knees. And you don't hear me. Look, unlocking this key is important because a lot of people love him but don't want to obey him. But when you put love with faith and obedience to commandments, the one thing that we thought was about prosperity inverts itself. They thought it was about our health and money. But the peace of God comes because the position is reversed. Ah! I'm sorry. Ah! Ah! You know, when you do not know what to say, the Spirit will usher in moanings and groanings for you. Yeah. What that was, that was, I don't have much time, but I got to stay right here. Ah, and I'm just going to say it like I want to say it. It is reversed here. That while I was praying and working on my faith, while I was loving him and obeying him, I had to kneel on my knees and I had to pray to him. But once I found him and unlocked the door, he told me get up and he began to go to his knees for me and my life now is complete because he's on his knees so that I can stand up he's praying for me so that I can get everything you thought it was wealth but it is my relationship you thought it was health but it is my intercessor you thought it was prosperity but it was the peace that comes from God because he's not stopping praying for me. The key to my secret place, the key to my anointing, how do I make it through my suffering is because God refused to get up from his knees and he keeps praying for me. The prophetic anointing is that he prays for us. There's nothing that I can go through that he hasn't already covered because he's leading me from my future. And he said to the disciples, after he has come back to them, he said to the leader then, if you love me, then you will feed my sheep. Patar says, why you keep asking me this? He said, because I'm just trying to heal you up. If you love me, you will Feed, 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 feed my sheep. Because what you do to the least of these, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was sick, when I was in prison, because you loved me, you did what I asked. And then they said to him, Jesus, how then do we make it into your kingdom? And Jesus says to Patah and to the leaders of the new ministry, 
he says something very powerful to them. He says to them, when they found this last key, and Pata, when you have been delivered from denying me, and you turn back, and you heal up your brothers, what did he say to them? Strengthen them. What does it mean to strengthen? It means to give them a share of the power that I gave to you. Sister Bank, to John 14, it says, And because I pray for you, I now know that the power you have is because... Sister, come finish that for me. And I will pray that the Lord, I don't know where you are, sister, shall give you another comfort. So, I pray for you now that the Lord sendeth to you the power that sustained me and the power of the comforter. Come on, read that, sister. And give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And abide with you forever. Mm. I have given you the knowledge of these keys. But let us acknowledge that we need one more understanding to open this door. Now, so that you are clear The key, I should have said it earlier, but I got too excited, I'm sorry. The key is the word of God. The key is a reference to how Jesus applies the word of God to unlock the promise of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is clear that the kingdom of God is not without you, but the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus is also very clear that I stand at the door in your heart. But I can't unlock it if you don't have faith, love, and are obedient. So Jesus is inside of us, but can't get in the heart. Why does Jesus want to get in the heart? Because God said, I will no longer write my laws and have my covenant on stone. But I will write my laws and have covenant on the hearts of men. But though Jesus has with him the promise of total peace and the comforter, he can't give you the kingdom unless you unlock the door. He can stand there, but he can't unlock it. So you need one more key. And this is found in Revelation 3. In the message to the church at Laodicea. And it says to us, I don't know, is anybody? All right, I'll give it to you. Revelations 3 20. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, look. That man is the working key. Look, that's how it has to be. Where the Spirit of God, the Word of God is in you. Oh, man, you got my, that's how I'm coming home. So you remember that. Revelation 3.20. And let's go to 22. Are you ready? He let, that, oh, let everybody, can, let, let everybody say this one together. Revelation 3.20 says, here I am. <laughs> no, no, say yes. yes. Oh, that was, I say that like that so then you finish off, you know, because I'm trying to catch my breath for the, for the last leg of the journey. Now, it wasn't that I was going to continue reading, but I just wanted to excite you to read. Okay, so you ready? One more Here I am, verse 20. Yes, but some will say, behold. I stand. Oh, yes, look. If anyone. Here's my voice. Come into him. Wait, 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 wait. I'm standing at the door. Get in if you don't have faith, love, and obedience.
obedience. But if you mastered these keys of yourself and you open your door to your positivity of your thinking and the confessions of your mouth, I will come in. But you don't know I'm there if you haven't learned to hear my voice. If you haven't studied the Gospels, how will you know my voice? For my sheep know my and none other. I am standing. Prophets, listen to me. This is an age of the open door. Jesus, where is he? He's in their hearts. They've been waiting for him to come back. And he said it in Revelation. Where is he? In their hearts. But I'm standing. Listen to Jesus. Jesus is talking to you. I'm standing at a door inside people where the kingdom is and I can't get in. That is the problem of the age. The stony heart. And he calls a prophet to do what? To go into the hearts of men and women so that you can what? Unlock the door. If prophets don't know how to get into hearts, you are worthless in this age. How do you get into the hearts of men and women? You got to be his voice. And what does it mean to be his voice? You got to know his word. Revelation 3.20, brother, say it again. Show him what I'm talking about. You got to know his voice. You got to know the word. Time out for prophets who don't know the word. Time out for prophets who are saying, I got to get my sword. Behold, in the mouth of the Messiah, the sword was the tongue. Forget having the word on your iPad. That's the last age. Forget writing down the word. That was the last age. Forget saying I got a prophecy, but I got to write it down first. No, that's the previous age. This age, prophets are instruments, mouthpieces for the Messiah standing in the hearts of men and women who are turned away from him and stand at the door and step in for Jesus and begin to speak the word so that it melts the stony heart so Jesus can come in and sup with them and he begins to prepare table before them in the presence of their enemies and he anoints their head with oil the master key is found in the next verse just go to it and I promise it to him that overcometh wait let me say goodbye first uh, yeah. listen Sorry, you know I'm a boss, so I can be a little bossy sometimes. Hold on. Yeah. I love you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for allowing me to come and to give you this revelation of the keys to the kingdom. We might have thought that he gave them to Peter, but he didn't. He just gave Peter knowledge of what was to come. You must go into your future now and use these keys. Use them for the deliverance of the people. We are called now to open doors. If we open it, they won't come out of closets. Mama. It's a closet because they haven't been delivered behind it and they're coming out themselves. But the open door is us standing there with Jesus and speaking the word so they're transformed on the other side. And when they open up the door and commune with him, they come out of their closets delivered. The previous ages wanted deliverance to happen at the altar of the church. 
But in this age, deliverance happens at the altar of the heart. The church is no longer external to you, but the church is within you. Behold, the kingdom of God is with The fellowship of the saints is the power of the prophet. When you perfect your eye to understand, receive, and know the gospel. The perfect eye is the one who knows the gospel. Now, hear me. The perfect eye is the one that knows, not the one who can read it from the book. <laughs> and when you master the prophetic life, opening doors of people whose hearts are stone, delivering them from their closet matters, then here's the prophet of the Messiah who spoke to us in the future in the book called Revelation. All right, sister, I'm ready for you. And this is the revelation that comes from the Messiah who spoke to us in the book that is leading us from our future. And it reads, to him that overcome. And I like victorious. Anybody have NIV? It says victorious. And to those who are victorious. But all right, overcome is all right. Let's go. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne? A seat at my throne. Come on and say, as the Father did. Oh, 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 yes, yes. Y'all says, as I have also overcome, and I sat down with my father. On his throne. What's the next? So. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Listen to what the Spirit says to you. If you don't mind, can we confirm receiving this? with just a little praise, just to thank God. That if you master the perfecting of your eye and you learn how to lead from the future, which is in the hearts of men, and you know how to get into the heart of the man or the woman by unlocking the doors of faith, love, and obedience, and you understand how to become the word of God, the voice of God, taking in his words and his teachings, then you now can stand there before Christ at the closed door of the hearts and you can speak to it. They are converted. Jesus comes in. He sits and sups with them and dines with them. And to you who are victorious in that moment, you shall earn a seat that is right in the seat that Jesus inherited from the Father. And in that seat is everything that the prophet needed. Here is the blessing for the prophet. Lift your hands and receive this. Because you became the voice and you sacrificed for the sake of the gospel, everything that you have asked for Believing that God has already done it is now given unto you. No, 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 no. Because the prophet has sacrificed receiving so that the prophet can be an extension of the arm of God. When the open door comes and deliverance happens for others, you should rejoice at their deliverance because now everything you ask for, God delivers for you because of your obedience. Every While you are prophesying, God is delivering your children. While you are prophesying and the word comes to pass, God allows you to get a new home. Every time the word of God manifests, in your life for someone else, the blessing that you need comes to pass. The prophet should not worry while they're working. For because of your work, you shall reap the prophet's reward. And if you believe it without seeing it, come on and praise him like you received that.